Brighton, one of the most well-known seaside resorts in all of England, with seaside attractions, shops to visit and a thriving art scene. It's no wonder Brighton and Hove have a tourism industry that makes £1 billion a year. But we're not here to talk about Brighton's beautiful scenery or even Brighton's tourism economy. No, instead, we're here to talk about a younger economy that's making just as much money. Brighton's digital economy. In this documentary, we'll be looking at some of the things that make up Brighton's economy. I think that trend towards very small businesses reflects changes in the way that work and the nature of work is happening through um, almost like a fourth industrial revolution. It digitally transforms everything, so the way of working changes. From the people making the ideas... What am I supposed to do with that? My wedding day is ruined! ...to the technology making the scenes. Dude, there's a spaceship now above me. I can fly around it. Join us as we map out what drives Brighton's digital economy. But before we take a look at Brighton's booming business, there is first one component we must look at. This tool is an important one for anyone looking to go into the digital economy. A component that may as well be the bloodline for businesses in Brighton. This incredibly important tool is... A cup of coffee. Yes, according to Brighton Hove's Executive Director of Economy, Nick Hibbert, coffee has been a binding force for the businesses of Brighton. The emergence of Brighton and Hove's digital economy started uh, probably in the 90s and started in the coffee shops of Brighton and Hove as part of really the development of the creative industries that were already strong in the city. Um, and what we started to see was very small companies emerge through collaboration and networking through, co through our coffee shops. Nick Hibbert is following Richard Florida's idea of the creative class, a group of people that think of new creative content and technology. They're made up of scientists, artists, people from agriculture, and they all follow the same thing, looking to blend together work life and leisure. And we'll look for places that do just that. According to Brighton Fusebox 2, a report documenting the digital economy in Brighton, nearly 70% of freelancers interviewed had lifestyle as one of their three top reasons for deciding to move to Brighton. I'm here with a laptop and some cappuccino. So then, the question has to be asked. Am I busy at work on a project or am I relaxing at a coffee shop? Well, the answer to that question with the creative class is, it's a bit of both. These creative ideas can be raised in restaurants, bars, and yes, coffee shops. One of the main appeals of doing this is not only to relax, but also to have the chance of networking with other businesses. To see the creative class in action, I'm going to visit Platform 9 to go to a Coffee Plus content meeting, where groups of businesses will gather round to discuss increasing capital over some cappuccino. Hi, my name is Toby Moore. I'm the co-founder and director of Content Club and we provide tools and learning for content creators and digital marketing professionals. We organise three to four free events a month in Brighton for content creators, business owners, freelancers as a way of creating shared learning, as a way of facilitating people becoming a part of a community and also as a way of demonstrating what we can do as a, as a company and a set of people as well. The coffee meetup group will write down some problems they have with their business on a sticky note, put them up to the wall and then brainstorm on ideas of how to overcome these problems. Today, Nick is going to talk about how to get your business noticed in Google. This may seem trivial, but in an age of digital technology, it's an increasingly important skill to have. As Matthew Bellringer from Meaningbit, a company created to help smaller businesses grow, explains. So, when online marketing started, everything was brand new and people were very naive. I remember when we had banner adverts, you know, and that was the gold standard, was you had a good banner advert to sell your product online. Around the mid-2000s, everyone stopped clicking on banner adverts. 
just it just changed. It wasn't anything deliberate or conscious. It's just everyone started not seeing them and not clicking on them. It's actually about consent to market and not bombarding people with stuff they don't want to hear, but instead giving them something valuable that they do want to hear and then developing your market that way. This is one of the strengths of smaller businesses and freelancers in Brighton. The less rigid structure of smaller businesses, along with the access of pools to talent other small businesses bring along with them, has allowed Brighton to adapt to an ever-changing world. Increasingly, we will see people go through many careers in their lifetime and to develop a portfolio of different ways of earning money, so a portfolio of income. And um, the approach that um, our economy follows, which is a, an approach of very many sole traders, freelancers and home workers, really reflects that shift and um, may mean that the city um, has a more flexible economy, which means it's able to innovate its way through some of the economic changes or shocks that might happen in the future. According to the first Brighton Fusebox report, for a cluster to thrive, it needs to be fed by the right local resources. The Brighton Technology Cluster, for example, has drawn on the supply of creative entrepreneurs, a skilled workforce, networking systems for sharing knowledge and access to appropriate clients. Brighton is a really small but really creative city uh, and a lot of people that uh, decide to leave their jobs and create their own business or go freelance or be that person that can provide really creative solutions to people, this is a really great place for them to do that. It's up both in terms of creating like a network, it's a fantastic hub for people to connect, find clients, find customers, find people to collaborate with and to create bigger businesses with, but also at the same time it's a great place of actually um, being able to connect with people that can help you achieve the goals that you want to achieve. Here's what a business owner that was interviewed for the Brighton newspapers has to say. You can be emailing back and forth, but if you're not sitting down with the client over a cup of coffee about the project, then it's not going to happen. Brighton's digital economy may be big when seen as a whole, but it's largely made up of numerous small or medium-sized enterprises. The strength of Brighton's economy is not in massive companies, but instead being a fertile ground for smaller companies with creative ideas. But what are these ideas? Now that we've got our creative juices flowing, we're off to look at the new hardware that's driving Brighton's digital economy. Behind me is New England House, and inside New England House is the fuse box, a collaborative workspace where businesses can get together and show off their ideas. It's also one of the only places to allow 5G to businesses in the country. The New England House is a property that the City Council owns and uh, we have let that property to businesses. It's actually the first uh, high-rise uh, factory um, ever built in the world. That, that building is only let to creative and digital businesses so what we've tried to do is to create a hub uh, for the digital industries of the city. We've gone to the Fusebox to look at a virtual reality showcase known as VR and to take a look at some of the experimental VR technology. I'm presenting this project that I've been creating for my final year of computer science in Sussex. Uh, it's essentially called Compositional VR. Uh, the core basis of it is that it's an experiment to see whether or not we can create music visually in a 3D virtual environment and then following on from that whether or not it's possible to develop a system which can predict the music that you're going to create before you've created it based on the past music that you've made. Essentially what we've done is we've taken the three scenes from the view of Shakespeare's most prominent plays and we've adapted them to be staged in a virtual performance space essentially. Um, so it's taking sort of the best of on location filming and site specific theatre and immersive theatre and um, theatrical rehearsal techniques and working with theatre actors and so on and fusing them all into a VR performance space and crafting a story for a single audience member who's present at the centre of the story. VR is a medium that's been growing heavily in Brighton. One of the interesting things that's happening in the digital economy um, within Brighton right now is that it's starting to mature. Um, so having started off as a, um, as a small business cluster, we're starting to see some medium-sized 
businesses businesses emerge as the as the cluster grows um, in the, in in the city, but we're also starting to see increasing specialism, and what that um, means is is that we're seeing an increasing density of immersive technologies um, emerge within the city. And by immersive technologies, I mean augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence. We're here in an inconspicuous alleyway. It may not seem like much, but Orange Row is actually the base for Catalyst VR's Brighton team. And today, we're gonna to visit them to test out Viso's Alto 100. This is Viso Space's Alto board, um, all the way from Sydney, Australia. And um, it's a locomotion solution for virtual reality. A VR hoverboard. We met up with business development manager Laura Loonstein. While Viso 100 and Catalyst VR are Australian companies, Laura decided to set up base in Brighton and now works with Catalyst VR's Brighton team to show off the new hoverboard. Laura is hoping that the hoverboard will change how we use movement in VR. In virtual reality, uh, when you're trying to move around an environment, um, you're wearing this headset. So you obviously can't use a normal room as you would without a headset on, otherwise you're gonna bump into things or you're not gonna know where you're going. Um, so we do have this problem, let's say, in, in VR, um, which is how do you actually move around in an environment? So we're um, coming up with different solutions on uh, what the best way to, to move around a virtual environment would be. Um, and the Alto board is a great way because you don't have to walk, you just get to fly. <laughs> but why has the Australian company decided to show off their technology in Brighton? So when I came to Europe, uh, a friend of mine who was actually working in tech out in Sydney and also involved in, in virtual reality, um, she said uh, that she was now based in Brighton and uh, it was a great place with you know lots of things happening in um, the digital scene and opportunity to meet other people um, doing the same kind of things and I did find a really great a really great scene um, with lots of support and spaces to, to demo your product um, and to to show other people what what you're doing to get feedback. A lot of creative people come to Brighton and I think then they find themselves in this place where they want to work together, create businesses together, uh, help each other find customers and so on. Brighton is an important place for new technologies. Its access to a cluster of digital professionals allows people to give feedback on virgining technology. That's why demoing is so important, especially to equipment like VR. The reality is that you are relying all the time on, on other people because the mediums are so new that um, you're constantly sort of on the forefront of learning and so are the others that do it with you. So um, it's actually really important, you know, for, for programmers to share ideas, for 3D artists to consult one another. It also shows us what's up and coming, or yeah. hoverboards in the far corner, or how you create music in VR and stuff, and how do those things then stimulate us and challenge us. What differentiates Brighton as a place is that focus on creativity, that the, uh, the pace of work and the ability to, to focus on actually creating really strong creative work over just trying to bash out the next project and move on to the next client. So far, we've been talking about connectivity. Coffee shops, pubs, workspaces, anywhere where a conversation can be started. But the next bit of connectivity we're talking about is slightly more subtle and it can't even be seen with the human eye. And that connectivity is the Internet of Place. Um, the Internet of Place is um, a proposal I inherited from my predecessor actually, Professor Gillian Youngs. 
and she um, was interested in the notion of location-based data and how it created a contextual um, interactive experience, I think is the best description. So for example, you could scrape data from tweets of everyone around a train station and have a little bit of an insight into people's experience of that place. So that would be intelligent, responsive environments where things are reading and responding to, to our behaviours, I suppose. But the Internet of Place isn't just going to change how we interact with trains. The constant flow of information can help us organise traffic better, help businesses target customers easier, and even change how society interacts with democracy. So one of the notions behind the Internet of Place that I'd like to progress is the idea of a user-driven city which is obviously incredibly ambitious and incredibly difficult and could just be a big mess. <laughs> but ostensibly, it'd be interesting if we could get live, data-driven, participatory decision-making into intelligent systems. Then we start, to have, um, we start to translate the concept of democracy into technology. We have a meeting tomorrow with East Sussex County Council in Lewis about smart cities. And I was wryly um, amusing myself with the notion of Lewis of all places where, where people are still destroying parking meters becoming a prototype um, smart city. Society and technology are always changing and it will be interesting to see what Brian does to suit those changes in the future. But until then, there are at least two things we can be certain of. It will have people connecting and it will have people drinking coffee.